Okay, great. There we are. A uh, bit late, but uh, we're here for you with uh, Quantum Leap Live. And Corey, uh, welcome. Yeah. I just wanted to um, first give a brief introduction. You know, this show's about, if you're just joining us, it's about uh, business development and really how to generate uh, a wave of success, be it personal or primarily business oriented. And uh, my co-host, uh, Corey Nod, I'll let him do the introduction. He's actually going to be leading off with the presentation today. So uh, thanks for joining us. Hey, everyone. I'm Corey Nod, and I am a uh, transformational business coach. And my company is Take Wing Coaching, and I have my business partner and wife, who is Dale Nod. Okay, great. Uh, Corey, if you don't mind just telling us briefly about, in a nutshell, what, you, what you're going to be presenting today, and then I'll let you get right to it. I'm going to give you screen sharing if you need it. Yeah, we, we talk a lot about Lyft on here, and, and Gail and I have been looking at, you know, what was our purpose of Lyft and what has changed for us. And uh, over, you know, our original intention was to create a community because during our travel, we weren't sure how often we would actually have access to online. So, you know, having fixed schedules and things like that, running cohorts was not, was something that we found that would thought would be a challenge. And then as COVID hit, people were looking for community. So we started that and now we're starting to say, uh, pull back. We, we still will have the Lyft community, but I think we're gonna go back to the cohort, cohort style of coaching where people can be in groups and, and learning and then use Lyft as a platform for further connection and um, just engagement. So it's it's definitely something we enjoy doing and, and it's easier for us now because we're not traveling full time. So we can we can create a fixed schedule and, and be available. So that's kind of what I'm gonna go at today is a little bit about what our first um, initiatives are going to be in that. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, I look forward to joining you in those cohorts. I think a lot of what you guys have done with that platform has been a great model for me on how to kind of teach some of this stuff and why my content's different i always you guys have such an expertise in so many different things that um between the two of you that's uh, been a beautiful thing to see and i look forward to the new offerings yeah yeah i can talk about that sure so yeah that's um let me know when you want me to start yeah you okay. take it away it's all you all right well so what we're gonna do is our first cohort is and, and gail's expertise really is marketing uh, let me get this set up. For some reason, it's deciding to plot my displays once again. Um, zoom, zoom, zoom. Okay. Uh, so what we're finding is, and this is something we found a year after year after year, is that small business owners get caught up in their day-to-day, -day, uh, and they don't make the time to plan for their strategic marketing. Right. So it, it tends to be like, oh, my gosh, I need to do some marketing. Oh, my gosh, I need to give a, uh, a, a you know, weekly presentation of BNI or I've got to give my feature presentation BNI and everything kind of gets done last minute. So it, it, it's not strategic. And when we do things on the fly, we tend to forget what we're trying to accomplish, which is to help people give us referrals or help people, you know, find us online or help people make a decision about buying from us and so what we're going to do is we're going to launch this first cohort is really going to be about um we're calling it the marketing flight plan so we're going to create guidance and accountability to get the kind of clients that people want we're going to work on the buyer's journey which is what is the pain or problem that people have and, and we're often pretty familiar with that but looking at it more from the buyer side versus how we think of it um, how do they become aware of a solution being available? How do they become aware of your solution? How are you talking to them about your solution? A lot of times it's a push. You need this. Whereas it's like, look at that. Look at how they're talking about it. And then finally, what is that decision stage? So we're going to be really working through that strategically, strategic flight plan um, with this idea that you can use this in social media marketing, traditional marketing, referral marketing, networking and so on and yeah so it's it's we're going to be working on the personas how people look for uh, solutions what options they might have so remember people start looking at different options they're not just going to find you and say oh that's immediately thing i need unless you're really good at connecting them 
So maybe how do you get back into their awareness and stay there? And then once they choose that solution, how do you actually bring them in? And then we'll be working all the different kinds of content required to make that happen. So for each each person, each person in their business is unique. So not all of these things are needed for every person, but what's the right thing for you and then how to do that. And one of the great things about working with coaches like us is that we do work a lot on mindset. And sometimes it isn't that people are doing the day-to-day -day thing and forgetting to be strategic. Sometimes it's, and I know I run into this a lot, is for myself, is we put it off because we aren't certain exactly what to do or we still feel uncomfortable about something. So diving into that mindset, where is that discomfort? How can we take action? And how can we help with accountability or be a big part of the strategic marketing flight plan. I don't know exactly when we're starting. It'll be, we'll probably start the first one in April and then add on cohorts each month. So it'll be sort of like a mastermind group, but separate from the you know, future cohort, each one running separately. And then we have other things in the works for the business planning and so on. But marketing is, is something that people are really stuck on. And then it's, we're coming into an economy where it's going to become more and more important. There'll be a lot of people out there desperate for clients and we don't want our clients to be desperate for clients yeah no that i think that is a critical piece to the puzzle and a great place to start and i think really the nuances especially something like a coaching product you know to yeah. sell coaching because it's like my program and also what you guys offer if you haven't done anything like this, you need it, but a lot of people don't know how badly they need it. So right. how do you open up that possibility that this is something that they need in kind of a, a simple way? Um, so you have to do that for them to, to get them to enroll in the coaching, but they have to also learn how to do that for whatever they're selling. So yeah, yeah. I think a lot of times people don't really know what they need. And, or, you know, so that's, again, it's hard, they have a problem but they don't necessarily know what is the solution. And if we're kind of presenting it as like, I have a solution, you need this, they don't really know that they need that. So that's that's where we go into, how do we show them that what we have might be a solution without making them feel like they're pushing on them. But at the same time, stay in their, stay in their options. And that can be a challenge too. Now, do you envision this as like an ongoing a course that people go in every week and at a certain time or how are you looking at offering this yeah so gail is, is still putting that together but typically our cohorts are there's a fixed time each week it be an hour hour and a half and then you know they go through and it's in q a and, and covering something of course we do recording so people who can't attend for whatever reason to do the recordings and then we always have to lift the office hours so if somebody can't make you know the regular one they can come to an office hour with questions but other people might be there as well. I, I really like learning in groups. I, I like helping people with that because everybody has something to contribute and we keep it on a generous feedback model. So, you know, I don't always have all the answers. Somebody may be saying, I don't know, should I public speech, should I do video and so on? We can work on that, but other people can give their experience and we learn from that. And, and, and then also people can help each other with accountability. So I love the cohort mastermind type model, coach led. Yeah, you, you know, as a teacher, some of the best advice my mentor gave me anytime you can create an environment where people can learn from other people. Right. That's how you've won because you don't only right. want them learning from you, you actually want, you know, almost, I think, even half of the learning come from others, so to speak. So if you right. can set that up, and, you know, I, I've seen that in Lyft, because we all face kind of similar challenges. And it's interesting, also, I think people are at such different places to have like maybe somebody's brand new to this and we often will forget what it's like to be completely brand new. Maybe you switched careers or something. So if somebody like that shares and then you have other people who are right there with them, you know, it's a really a powerful thing. And we, we can also test some of this out with, you know, either our own lunch and learn or, you know, that rotary event that we're going to be putting on in May too, to to. Um, sure. you know, use that as an intro to get people um, to, you know, enroll in the, the lift um, or show them yeah, what's available. What I love about doing intros is we usually just give it all away. I mean, it's, it's the information is there. You can find it. It's not about having the information. It's about actually processing and using it um, you know, to your advantage in the right way. So 
Uh, people come to our workshops, we explain all about it. And if you can do it yourself, that's great. But what we're talking about right now is most people don't, because for whatever reason, they put it aside and do what's more comfortable. Great. And I just had a quick kind of, kind of a rapid fire round here on some of the the, the topics that we've been talking about, and, you know, a lot of these relate to Lyft as well, not, um, you know, just a quick recap. Last week, I presented on my master class, uh, the Quantum Leap master class, which is actually named after this podcast, because it's based on a lot of the content that Corey and I go over. And uh, Corey is actually a collaborator on there. He's going to do a guest lecture as part of that master class and how that ties into lift you know how lift is kind of the other piece to the puzzle the the yin and the yang if you will and i think um that my master class starts april 3rd and you can enroll right now on the website i'm going to put both the link to lift and to the master class and um we were gonna i just wanted to kind of go over some of the key things the you know there's 12 modules total in that master class and we'll kind of take them a little out of order but it's really intended to how to create a quantum leap for you and your business and maybe it's something in your personal life um a hobby or a, a sport that you want to um maybe it's martial arts you know how how to become a you know better martial artist um as a big fan of bruce lee and his teachings i say that and um so First, I wanted to talk, ask you about this concept of vision versus definite plan, you know, so there's, there's such a difference here about, okay, we need an overall vision, you call this often a 360 vision, but then how are we going to actually get there? And it's kind of interesting that, you know, so much of our thing is just really the journey, 98, 95% of it is the journey. So how would you describe just the importance of these two terms and kind of how they relate together, how to, how, how to think about these is in, in terms of entrepreneur trying to figure out, well, okay, what's my vision? What's my definite plan? Yeah. I, I do believe that the kind of global vision view really serves in business. And if you're working on something very specific like leadership or uh, standing out in your industry, or, you know, even like working with a health coach, a vision might be a little more focused on just that one thing. Um, but it's ultimately an end result. So give an example, you know, how do you want to be seen as an industry leader? Is it going to be, you know, on the public stage doing keynotes? Is it going to be, um, you know, writing articles and you know, publishing them in, in maybe your trade magazines and maybe more information to the public, right? Because sometimes being an industry leader isn't so much being somebody who, you know, creates new ideas, but digests them or makes them digestible to people who are not, not savvy on the information, right? So there's, there's so many different ways you go about it. So that can become, what is it that makes you an industry leader? Like there's there's somebody I know who's a speaker on the topic of, of the dental stuff and she's she's an amazing speaker and she's been doing it for 30 years and you probably never even have heard her name unless you're in the dental industry because all she does is talk to dentists, right? But if you're in the dental industry, you've heard her. So she's an industry leader. She doesn't come up with new ideas about dentistry. She makes it easy for people to understand the, the information they need to run their dental practice. And, but somebody else on the other side could be, you know, talking to people about good dental practice, good dental hygiene and things like that. So they're an industry leader for that kind of thing. So when you're putting together your vision, it's like, what do I really want to do? Who, who do I, who wants to see me? What are they getting from me? How are they feeling about it? How does it, you know, change uh, my industry, help my industry and, you know, kind of creating an overall vision of what it would like to be in three to five years. And then your definite plan is going to be, okay, what are the goals that I need to put in place to get there? Because if your goal is to be the person who digests information and speaks to audiences around the world about something that's, they like architecture, but make it easy for people to understand why it's so valuable and important and talking to, say, you know, politicians and investors and things like that, then your goals ought to be around, how do I get into those groups? How do I get people to, um, you know, you might set goals on writing and things like that around that kind of work. Um, so that that would be to pursue your vision. If, you, if you're focused, if you set your vision to do something else, I mean, your goal is to do something else and that wouldn't be an alignment. Yeah, the, there's also such a connection here to what you're offering in that new Lyft cohort, because this is how you connect with your ideal client. It's that vision that people 
have to buy into, you know, you, you have that expression, they don't, um, you, you know, you don't buy the product, you kind of buy why you're doing it, or I'm, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, uh, <laughs> I don't have the quote down the way you have it, but that's a Simon Sinek thing, so that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the, all this work, and I think the key is the clarity too, because you got to be able to say that so succinctly and create that vibration around it that, you know, people, people feel it can't be kind of cloudy or murky, you know, and uh, I think so that's the kind of clarity that you gave me and you give a lot of people in Lyft. Um, for example, I just think you want to be known for one thing. You know, that woman is known for around the dentist industry because she, you know, produces that content better than anybody else, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. hard to make dentistry funny, but she's very funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Um, this is a little bit in the same vein as that, that first question, goals versus daily practice. So um, there's vision, there's goals. I guess we should talk about how vision relates to goals and then daily practice. And, you know, we've, we go over and over daily practice, but I think this is like kind of the, the keys to the kingdom, so to speak. I used that term last week, but um, if you don't mind just taking us through those three terms and how they relate and why they're critical to business owners. Well, yeah, the other, the other side of it is a vision is an affirmation. Right. So when we when we write out a vision and we look at it and we refer to it and, you know, you can make it part of your daily practice. It's, you can make it part of your weekly practice, whatever it is. And it can be pieces of it or all of it. You know, ours is three pages. It takes a while to read. Um, but I like to connect the different pieces of it. But ultimately, it is an affirmation. And, and you know, the mind, as you read these things, you do two things. You inspire yourself. So it's just inspiring. If it's an inspiring vision, if it's not inspiring, we need to just make it bigger. But the other side of it too is it is your mind, you know, takes that information and and lives it in the present right, as you read it. It's just like reading a book or reading something else. So you just start to create, you know, they call that the law of attraction. You just start to become that thing that you are telling you to yourself you are, which is what a vision, a well-written vision does. It says, this is who I am. Even though it's not going to happen for three to five years, you're telling it as if it's in the present. So you make that part of your daily practice. It's inspiring. And that helps with keeping on track with the goals. Even if the goals aren't really well-defined and they ought to be for action plans and so on, it still keeps that goal more in focus. Great. And that also helps motivate your daily practice. I think you, you and Gail call your vision. It's almost kind of provides you the fuel to be able to get up every morning. If you don't have that vision that you're excited about becoming something that's bigger, that's important in the future, then how do you get through like the nitty gritty of, you know, sending out maybe your, <laughs> well, none of us really make a whole lot of cold calls with once you get into referral or, you know, networking, but, um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we'll have Tammy joining us our second segment. I think we can go over a little bit and we'll let her in a bit late just because, um, I don't think she's going to use the whole half hour. I did want to touch on a couple, three key things. Maybe we'll have time here. We'll see, uh, or we'll drop the other one, this concept of attitude, you know, and this is something that, you know, I've really loved, Earl Nightingale's work on this and Bob Proctor kind of picked up where he left off. But how do we keep an attitude for success? And this is something until I joined BNI, I had kind of a bad <laughs> attitude about videography. I kind of did it as a side business as part of my political career, but I didn't see any potential to grow it beyond a side business. And then I got into BNI, and I was like, oh, I all of a sudden have a good attitude for success. And I think, you know, B and I gave me that, but I don't know if you have any experience on attitude and this, you know, goes with, with mindset, which what you're saying, I think mindset and attitude are so closely aligned. So how, how do business owners keep a good attitude about their business? Um, well, I, there's, there is a core division. It's a big thing. It's always kind of keep that inspiration going. I think attitude is a lot of times is informed by, you know, our early life. It's the messages we got from our parents and our peers at a very early age. So, you know, if, if somebody's attitude for success is, I don't want to say flawed, but you're going to have those attitudes that 
your parents and maybe some of your early peers had towards that. And, it, and success can mean so many different things, but how you define it and then where are those stories coming up? And that's, that's where we go into mindset. Right? We do a lot of that in NLP and so on, which is just to say, okay, how does that feel? What does success feel like to you? And, and sometimes people are afraid of success or they feel that they have to do something to be successful, but that's not in alignment with what they really want. So it, it can be, that can be, um, that conflict, that internal conflict can cause uh, indecision and, and problems. So, um, yeah, it's it's success is a is a is a moving target, and having the right attitude is like okay. So what's in my way, and how am I going to overcome it? Am I going to seek out coaching? Am I going to read some things? Am I going to inspire myself with vision? There's so many different things you can do. The attitude is like okay, I've got to keep moving forward. How do I do this? I think that's the attitude to adopt. Whatever success means for you, and even as it changes over the years. The attitude is to keep moving forward as far as I'm concerned. And that's what I love about entrepreneurs. And, and maybe that's what you didn't experience. And a lot of us don't experience until we're around other people who are entrepreneurs is that constant moving forward. Yeah, great. And I actually heard, um, you know, Bruce Lee's daughter use that analogy that you used last time about the the um, sculptor, that it's not necessarily adding more to us. It's about chipping away it kind of what is holding us back to become our more simplistic and authentic, you know, our true self. And once we get in touch with that, you know, it's, you don't have to add a bunch of garbage or stuff. It's about just really the carving out of what our successful business and self looks like. And I, I love the simplicity of that. And it, they put it so beautifully in the, the, the book, you know, that I was listening to that be water, my friend, I don't know how, how, where, where you came across that analogy, but that's such a great analogy of our business and ourself. You know, I came out of it from the more of the artist perspective, right? If you sculpt, you, if you break away, you know, the artists, you know, the great sculptors will say that they never actually are the ones who create the statue of sort of the stone and forms of what it can do. Um, but I think another thing, you know, kind of going to, you know, Bruce Lee and all that is more of the, kind of the essence of Taoism. So if I start getting into a little more of the spiritual coaching, which I do a little bit of, you know, we talk, it talks a lot about simplicity and I, and I love that term because if we make things more simple, if we let go of what has to be, then we start to get to choose what we want, right? It's, it's, what do I want success to be? And there's going to be things stuck in our heads that, you know, affect us on that, but getting to that simple part, it's, it's really about choice. It's not about what pressures come from the outside. So I think it worked, David. But... Yeah, no, and I just let Tammy know we're going to go a little bit longer here and then we'll wrap up because I do want to go through these two last things because I think we have time. Now, this concept of terror barrier, which we've touched on, I think we'll probably do a, a bigger segment on this. Anytime you move towards your goals, we kind of freak out in some way. Maybe you're used to failure. It's like a comfortable thing to just giving up. That's like your comfort zone. So I think we have these kind of limiting beliefs about ourselves that once we step out and maybe we, maybe we make great progress and then, but at some point we're going to run into this barrier of, um, you know, and, you know, Bruce Lee, <laughs> why I love his philosophy is he's about always moving forward. Like you right. never stagnate that they call this the the negative gap between the idea and like the action or the realization. So, so many people get stuck in that, the, the negative gap, he calls it, but you actually want to be kind of in the gap in, in the doing part of it. So, yeah. um, you yeah. know, <laughs> if you have any you know, th thoughts on, you know, how to, how to keep moving towards our goals. I mean, I think lift and the community there, um, you know, daily practice, but. No, I think you have, you, know, you have a lot of great tools. It, it is, I, I love, there's a Bruce Lee video I just watched where he gets beaten, right? You know, he's beaten by something, you know, he's like, I have the best. And this other guy comes with his, I am the best. And I, you know, leave this group and he gets beaten up. And then he's like, okay, through all the stuff he's like you're gonna train me so that i'm gonna come back and you know win this time and this guy's like no way but you're gonna do it and and what i love about that is this you know at first he's kind of like in a funk i lost i can't believe i lost i'm no good and i'm nothing like i said i was and he said okay well what do i have to do to change this go and you know and, and do this thing and then so he's moving forward no matter what he's like i am not going to stay in my funk and then you know, in our physiology and I, NLP, we call that being stuck in water. And so how do we set ourselves on fire and get motivated to do something? 
And that's, it can be, you know, terror barrier is there and it's going to bring you back constantly. And then, so I look forward to talking about that. I, I just had a big aha yesterday about what's really causing to work my terror barrier and where it comes from. And a lot of times it's just fear of abandonment as a child. We learn to put limits on ourselves so we don't get abandoned and we can survive in the tribe. And that lives with us for our entire lives and, and creates our comfort zone. So we keep pushing the comfort zone and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but it will snap back if we don't keep making it bigger. I have a couple anecdotes from the Bruce Lee stuff. And he says he he doesn't fear the person who's tried 10,000 kicks. He fears the person who's tried the same kick 10,000 times, you know, right. this, this well, daily practice yeah. thing. And yeah. he actually learned a lot from his defeats or the things that were uncomfortable. For example, they they tried to run him out of Chinatown because he was training, you know, right. the the non you know, people you're not supposed to train with, you know, Kung Fu or his, his own version of it. So they, they staged a, a full combat fight in, it, you know, basically like a UFC type fight. And they said, if, if this guy wins then you have to leave, but he won, but he almost took it like a defeat because he realized the kind of panic in an actual fight, how everything is so different, but that actually really was a big, like uh, eye opener for him going forward that he, you know, see, sometimes we see our victories as maybe defeats or they open up something else for us. But the important, important point was like leaving the comfort zone. So um, we'll, we'll end it here. And cause I do want to, we're going to let Tammy in. If you have any closing thoughts, feel free to make them. Otherwise we're going to get to our second segment. All right. Thank you. Okay. Perfect.